welcome to another episode of Conversations on your favorite channel, Ya. Yeah. Today, as always, we have a wonderful person as our guest on the show. Somebody who's a counseling psychologist, a renowned blogger, an author who has spent a collection of short stories, and somebody who is a leader of an army of ladies. We have the inimitable Jessina Becker. Jessina Becker. Jessina, welcome to Conversations. Thank you so much. You are from a place called Tirur in, in Kerala, which is definitely not uh, uh, a city. It is, it is either a semi-rural or a rural area. Now, for uh, the Jessina Becker that the world knows, you are a, an extremely sophisticated, very well-read, well-spoken lady. But still, you are firmly grounded and your roots are from a very semi-rural setting. Has it been of uh, influence to you? Or has it been, uh, in, in some ways, restrictive also? Um, it has been restrictive. Like I always say, uh, when someone becomes very famous, the fact that uh, they have not had an educational background, actually, the fact that they don't, they don't have a qualification goes on to become their qualification, okay? So okay. when we talk about somebody who's not educated and is doing extremely well in life, that becomes a qualification for them. So similarly, I come from a rural or like you said, semi-rural background. So, and uh, when the world knows me as uh, doing a lot of things, still coming from a village or a semi-rural background, I think then that adds a lot more value to my growth, a lot more value to my challenges. Because whatever you can do or whatever I have done, would have been a lot more easier and faster had I been in a city or had I been in a place where it was easy to reach uh, technically or many things. Even right now, we had a lot of technical glitch because I belong to this rural area. So had I been in a very cosmopolitan city, my growth would have been faster. But the fact that being from a semi-rural or a village area and still uh, handling all these challenges and going forward, I feel it adds up to my experience and it, it's also a qualification of how you can handle several challenges. Uh, all my friends tell me, I think you need to get out of that place and get into a place at least where you can have a decent internet. So I feel that it, it carves you a lot more stronger. It, it sharpens you to handle any kind of uh, challenges, be it technical, be it infrastructure, or be it even economic. No, yeah, there is something called the small town boy syndrome. You know, when it comes to when you when you look at uh, some of our national heroes, both in uh, the political spectrum, this the 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 film spectrum, and also the sports uh, areas, you found these small town boys having a much more fiercer competitive mode or um, the killer instinct is uh, comparatively higher than those who are born in a, in a typical city uh, dwelling. You know, I'm talking about people like Amida Bachchan. I'm talking about people like K.R. Narayan, the former president of India. And I'm also talking about uh, the, Indian, uh, the former Indian captain Mahendra Singh Dhoni. These are all people who were not born in, uh, in, a, in uh, sylvan settings. They were born uh, in an absolutely rural or semi-rural uh, areas. But the drive to succeed comes from the restrictiveness that, uh, that is offered by the, you know, the, 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 the rural settings. And you have another p person from the same setting. I come from a very rural uh, background. Uh, I remember uh, um, uh, being born into a large household. The, the, the first time we found uh, electricity in our household was when I was, grade f I was in grade four. So you have company, uh, Jasina. But I'm sure that this has added value to your growth and, uh, and your need to survive and also uh, powered you up to where you are at this point of time. But how would you like to uh, be known as a counseling psychologist, as an author, uh, or as a fashionista? Because you are all three com co combined into one. Uh, 
Uh, so, just fashionist is a new term that is associated with me. Uh, I don't think that would be something I would want to be identified with. Author, yes, uh, because the journey to become an author from being a blogger and a writer was very interesting. And that would exactly be how I would like to be known or associated with, because that's one place where you reach out to a larger audience. As a counselor, I'm restricted to the number of people I can reach out to. While as an author, my audience is uh, not something even I would know. It's a larger audience and people read you, people uh, enjoy what you write. They criticize you, they appreciate you. So that's a place where I feel there is a lot more scope for growth and development over being a psychologist. Now, um, I, I should also um, correct you there, uh, you know, from my perspective, because I called you a fashionista because you lead a large army of women who are into more than 12,000 people. You have it on a, on a Facebook group and you have one single, one common element, which is the sari. Now, sari yes. and India are, are interconnected. In, sari represents the Indian womanhood, as far as I am concerned, personally, if you ask me. Because in that six yards of sensuality, you combine the, all the facets of womanhood in it. Whether it's uh, a working woman, whether it's a, uh, you know, a woman who's doing a, ho a household chores, or a woman who's on a ramp, or a woman uh, who is uh, in politics, or in any stream of imagination. Uh, that symbolizes the Indian womanhood. Now, do you agree with it, or is it is it the same uh, thought that leads you to uh, or fires you up in leading this huge uh, ladies' initiative in terms of sari? Uh, we are twelve thousand members, but when you say sari represents an Indian woman, I would not completely agree with. Suppose you are on an international platform. And then the sari becomes a representation of an Indian woman because largely outside India, people know women, Indian women as wearing sari. But if you look in India, there are a lot of non-sari wearing states. We have Punjab, there's Kashmir, there is Manipur, Mizoram. These states don't wear sari. So in India, I don't think uh, sari is representative of Indian women. However, on my uh, platform, on Facebook, I have this large group called Sari in Style. I introduce Sari as a medium to come together. Okay, Sari is used as a medium to come together. Sari is a means of communication with each other. But in that group, we do a lot more activity that helps women, that support each other. Maybe you can say, uh, you know, we are we we have a sisterhood. So uh, Sari in Style, uh, the short form is S I S, which in itself means sis in a short form of sister. So it's a huge sisterhood there. We come together, we wear a sari for every occasion of ours, every post of ours is born, uh, sari is worn. We also encourage the Indian weaves, the Indian handlooms, but we also discuss many, many things that's very, very important to us, starting from our job, our family, everything we discuss there. So sari, for me, in that group, is a medium of bringing a lot of women together and having fun, discussing our uh, challenges. We have a lot of fun also there. We, we are highly spirited women out there. <laughs> okay. Now, 12,000 uh, women, definitely, that's, a, that's, that's an army. Uh, that's not uh, just a, uh, a confluence of people who are interested just in saris, I'm sure about it. And I'm sure it, it, it'll also, it also works in as a mutual help or a self-help mechanism where you can share a lot of ideas. But, but at the same time, sari, you know, an impeccably well-dressed lady in a sari is, uh, is definitely a thing of beauty. And as far as India is concerned, whether it's uh, in Indian spectrum or the spectrum abroad or outside, it is a fine display of not just womanhood, but also the rich culture that we, we hail from. And it also cuts across okay. religions, practices, cult, creed, everything, you know. And it also um, showcases women in a very pristine uh, form. Uh, and no man can wear, wear it. And <laughs> only a lady can wear a sari. Whereas uh, the Western clothes, even men can't. <laughs> 
So, uh, so it's more than uh, just a representation of India. Uh, that's what uh, you know people see in. Uh, but how did this thought come to you? Were, were you a sari buff at an early age, or is it it just happened? I I love I love sari. I still love sari. I have a huge collection of Indian handlooms across the country from every state. But uh, while my counseling days, when I began my counseling, a lot of women wanted help. Okay, a lot of women wanted help. Some of them don't approach. So I thought we need to bring women together under one common uh, place, uh, and then we speak about things that matter to us. But how do we bring people together on a virtual platform? Because I cannot be going town to town and doing this. So then f uh, Facebook groups were the best way to bring them together. But how would they be interested in coming together? Then two things I thought that really connect women are one is cooking and one is dressing. So uh, cooking, there were a lot of, uh, already there were a lot of cookery groups going on on the Facebook. Then I thought, okay, we will use our own culture to bring women together. So then I thought, okay, I'll form a sari group uh, where women come, showcase their sari, and through that group, slowly, slowly, I started introducing topics that was very important to women, that women find it very difficult to come out and talk about, because ours is a closed group and it's a private group, which means nobody outside can actually search for it and find it out. And whatever stays there, stays there. So even if you tag a man on our group, the tag doesn't reflect on uh, his profile outside. So it stays in the group. You cannot share anything. Suppose there's a great article on the group. You cannot share it out because we are a closed group. So we provide the maximum security that Facebook can provide. I mean, we cannot say beyond that. If someone were to download somebody's uh, photograph, like we have no say in that because that security Facebook doesn't provide. So whatever security Facebook provides, we provide that. We bring, we brought women under a roof. We discuss what is very important to us. We debate over it, but I make it very clear that we don't fight over it. We have healthy debate. We have conversations. We have communications. And I truly want to defy the stereotype where in India we say women, okay? Women are the biggest enemies of women. So that is one thing I want to defy. And I tell you, Sujil, on my group, there is nothing called a woman is the enemy of the other woman. There is nothing called a woman brings the other woman down. Because I feel that in, in my group, uh, there is no pulling each other down. If anybody tries to pull a person down, I make sure that I put an alert and say, no, we cannot do this. And such comments are removed from the group. So I really want to work against that victim which says women are the biggest enemies of women. In my platform of Sari and Style, you would never see that. In the past four years, if you would have, wouldn't have seen that. And I assure you in the future also, you wouldn't see that. Now that's excellent. Now, uh, this sounds like an extension of your, uh, your counseling uh, uh, part of your personality. Now, counseling is something which you do, and you're a, pa you're a child psycho psychologist who became a, a parent psychologist, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I'm a, uh, I'm a counseling psychologist. You're a counseling psychologist who specializes in parenting. Now, how does this parenting uh, influence you? How did you select, how did you come across, or how do you hit upon the subject of parenting? Because there is no hard and fast rules, there are no formula to become a good parent. Uh, even though scores and scores of books have been written on parenting, each child is different and each parent is different and the social situations around which a parenting or the process of parenting happens are completely different from each other. So how do you create a certain wire media, a certain formula to help parents in terms of uh, uh, how to become good parents or how to understand their wards or, or how to uh, create a harmonious environment in their families? What are the stuff that okay. you, you, you deal with in your, in your day-to-day uh, counseling psychologist's life? Okay, two things uh, taken from what you said. There is no formula to be a good parent because there is no good parent, okay? Now, how did I come into parenting field? There is no subject called parenting. There is nothing called parenting psychologist also. What happened is during my counseling days, a lot of the problems that came to me, a lot of the clients came to me with parenting problems, be it marital issues or be it uh, from their office issues. Somewhere, 
you know, the parenting aspect would come. And it was at the same time that I myself became a parent and I started blogging about Mehak and me. Mehak is my daughter. And I started putting down everything that Mehak and I do, how I communicate with her, how, how at certain instances I parent her, and at certain instances how she guides me to parent her. And that became very famous and people started reading and then people started coming back to me to talk only about parenting and the counseling were more or, more or less like let's say 80 percent of the counseling were going that way so i became a parenting counselor through experience over the years i became a parenting counselor and there are no formulas for parenting each individual case is different now if a parent is counseling with me for some parenting issues even two, if they have two children, it'll be two different ways they have to parent because two, no two child is alike. So if two children are not alike, the parenting also has to be dislike. It has to be two different ways of parenting. You cannot parent the same way two children. So these are the conscious things, you know, what I tell uh, parents, how mindfully you can parent. As, uh, and then bringing a lot of communication into parenting because we have lived through a generation where communication has not been important in most of the relationships. Now, to build a strong parent-child relationship, we need a lot of communication there. And a child who learns to communicate will definitely carry this good points of communication into all the other relationships that she has. So it has been over experience and because of the need of the client that I reached this area of uh, parenting. It was not a planned one and there was nothing designed as parenting consultant. Over experience I reached there and I write largely on the subject. I talk on that subject and I also have a complete book with the publishers about my parenting journey with my daughter and the name of the book is also between Mehek and me. So it has a com it has a compilation of all the in important instances, different different uh, instances which I've compiled over the years from the time she's 18 months till she's 12 and it has become a collection and it's gone for publishing. No, um, uh, I, I completely uh, sink in, uh, you know, with your thoughts on that. Uh, I have a, a question sent by a parent. Uh, she says, how do you deal with uh, a situation when you discover that your child is homosexual and he or she is not uh, in, a, in, a, in a mental state of mind or he, he or she is not in a state of mind to approach a parent? but is going through that crisis of uh, self-determination, of that, that conflict of not knowing what he is or she is, or going through that, the, the trauma of trying to identify their own, uh, you know, orientation. This is a, a very big challenge for parents. Uh, the child is not able to approach the parents because, again, because of the communication breakdown. Secondly, we, are, we do not live in a society where we say, okay, these things are normal. And if such you have such kind of an orientation, you can always come to parents and talk to them because parents themselves have not accepted this orientation. So when the child knows the parent has not accepted this orientation, it's very difficult for a child to go and approach the parents that I'm in a dilemma, I'm confused, I don't know which way to swing, my, my body says something, I feel something. So the child is going through a lot of dilemma which the child cannot discuss with the parents because the child knows very well that the parents may not be open to it. And we have a society, though there is a law, uh, that accept this, uh, we have a society that still has not accepted. So the child may not be able to communicate with the parent. Now, the number one thing the parent has to do is, though it's going to be very difficult for the parent, the parent at least has to listen to the child. And and this is all very, uh, you know, these, these are not something that the child chooses. These are something that the child's natural orientation. So though it's going to be very, very difficult for the parents, I do have a lot of clients who come and discuss this with me. And I keep telling them, don't think that it is easy for me to tell you to accept the situation. But given this kind of 
situation for your child, we have no other choice but to support our child. Now, the child is in such a dilemma, you as a parent has to be the balancing factor for the child. So at least the child can come and talk to you. Then we can take the child for professional counseling. Then we can take the, uh, you know, we can bring the child into a balance. So unless the child has a clarity and has a balance, the child cannot think straight. So if the parent's support is there, it can help the child. It's not very easy for the parent. I would say it is extremely difficult for the parent because, first of all, we cannot accept it. Secondly, we are, we are scared how the child will be accepted in the society because though we have rules for this, it's still not the normal in our Indian society. So how will the society accept? Will the friends be accepting of the child? So, so many things are running on the parent's mind. In fact, more than what is running on the child's mind. But being the parent, you are the one who has to be the in balance first. You cannot be in denial. You have to come out of your denial. Read about it. Talk to professionals and see how you can accept it and then help your child cope through this. And you have to hold your child's hand and walk with your child to, uh, through whatever that situation is to reach wherever the child wants to reach so that the child is also at home. What is that uh, you derive out of being a, a counseling psych psychologist? Is it a sense of satisfaction or is it a sense of achievement? Is it uh, a sense of uh, belonging? As a psychologist? Yes. Primarily as a psychologist, it's my uh, job that I do. Uh, so uh, through, th through that medium, a lot of people get helped. So when I say it's the profession that I do, first of all, I got into it because a lot of people came to me with the need and then I started counseling. So a uh, sense of satisfaction is you can say it's 50% it will be a sense of satisfaction because a lot of people come to me for counseling and after one or two counseling they go away because ideally what I understand from such, such situation is that they just want someone to hear them out. It's not that they want a solution to their problem or anything beyond that hearing them out. So after two counseling, when they know that somebody, a third person, without being judgmental, has heard them out, and then they discontinue their counseling. So at that point of time, I do, really do not know if they got a solution to their problem. So I, that's the 50% I say I'm not really satisfied. But yes, because I lend them a year, I'm okay with that. But the other 50% where we work together towards a solution, that is really, really gratifying because they come back and you know, each, each, at each uh, stage of therapy, they come back and say, this works, this did not work. I don't think I want to do this. So that when we work together, that is more satisfying and gratifying than just people listening to you. So this is, for me, it's a career. It gives, I generate income out of it. At the same time, a large community is getting help through this because if it is a mother who comes to me, then the entire family is getting help. If it's a father who comes to me, again, the entire family gets help. So if it is somebody from the organization who comes to me, a lot of people working with that person, the colleagues get help. So if it is only one person who's coming, but it's a cluster of people who gets help. So that's very, very satisfying though you are only touching one person and the, the behavioral change or the attitude change or the perspective change of one person can touch a lot more life. So it's like a community help that you do to one counselor. Now it took a Hindi film, it took a Bollywood film like Thare Zameen Par to change the mindset of a, a parental generation to understand their children from a closer perspective and also it opened the eyes of people and uh, their vision into subjects like uh, learning disability. Now, we've seen in our earlier days where people have branded, or either teachers have branded or the parents have branded children as uh, somebody weak in mathematics or weak in English or weak in that and weak in this. Till we realized through the frames of Tare Saminpar that anybody could have any kind of weakness which is nothing connected to laziness or lack of application, but a genetical, natural issue. Now, 
for such incidents to come out, what should the parents be, do, be doing? They need to be closely watching their children or they need to be reading more? See, uh, the difference that a movie like Tare Zameen Par created was awareness. There were a lot of people who did not even know there is something called learning disability. There were a lot of us in the audience who didn't know something like dyslexia is a reality. Maybe we read the word somewhere isolated in some novel or in some movie, we see very isolated. But the entire movie, Tare Zameen Par, was completely focused on this learning disability and the difficulty the parents go through to handle it. So uh, awareness was created. This kind of, uh, you know, psychological and psychiatric issues have not received much awareness in our society. It's always uh, framed as mental illness. The person is mad. But that itself is a very wrong thought. Okay, there are a lot of segments in mental illness and psychological illness that needs to be understood by people. So the awareness has to be created by the professionals. Here, the parents need to take an interest in learning such uh, or re about reading about such uh, illnesses and uh, psychological illnesses and psychiatric illnesses. Watch your child very close and then you will know what are the things the child is going through. That can happen when you spend time with your child, when you communicate with your child, when you observe your child. We all talk about parenting. We all talk about spending time with our children, but are we observing our children at that point of time? Are we communicating with the children? Because quite often children with learning disability cannot come to there and say, I have learning disability. The parent has to find that out by observing the child. And the problem with most of us Indian parents when we observe, the first thing we will do is deny, no, my child does not have it. Maybe one or two symptoms. It, it happened in Thari Zemin, but, but it's okay, it's not happening at home. So after observing, are you willing to accept that? Are you willing to consult a professional to rule out if the child is in the, in, you know, in the illness side or not? Do we take that step? And then when we uh, know our child has some kind of learning disability, how do we help the child with that? How do we make it very normal for the society? How do we make the rest of the people connected with us accept the child? Because a child cannot go around saying, I'm not accepted from the acceptance. All to do with the parents. The minute you decide to have your child, everything related with your child is your responsibility. You have to take interest in that. You are the one who is shaping the child's future. Quite often we, uh, we come back and say that, how come the teacher didn't understand? Now we need to understand one thing that the teacher has 20 to 30 students in a class. And it's very rarely that they can find out the learning disability of a child unless and until the teacher goes through an entire year with the child. But you have only one or two child. So it's you who should be able to identify your child's learning disability or any other disability that the child has. Just like you would know, okay, there is a temperature, the child has got fever. That's because you're observing the child. You see the symptoms. You know the child has the child is a little hot in the body. That's because you've observed it. Just like you observe physical symptoms, being a parent, you have the responsibility also of observing the emotional and the mental center. You are responsible for your child's physical and mental health. Absolutely. Now, at the same time, uh, to, to border our next uh, question on what is happening currently. Now, you look at any form of social media, what you see at this point of time, that parents literally splurging in the, uh, the grades and mark sheets of their children. 97.4, 98.3, 95.7, 91.3. Where is this generation going to? And are these grades be of any help? Or will the grades help these people become fine human beings, great professionals, or successful entrepreneurs? Is there any answer to that? Well, this is how I see it, Sujil. When we say, are these grades going to help? The grades are the ones, the grades decide which college or university your child gets into. Unless and until that system change. Yesterday, I was talking to a friend of mine who said that in a particular college in Kerala, unless you have uh, crossed 95% in 12th standard, you are not even able to apply to that college. So 
if that college accepts application forms only with children about 95 percent what happened to the other children who are below 95 the 94s 92s what 80s and 70s so if that education system doesn't change then the marks are important no, so just imagine but I, have an, you I have an answer to child. that i have an answer to that mm -hmm. what happens to the rest of the people they all become successful people in life because see, they is, are not is, they are not burdened see, by the grades the latest, <laughs> true true that see now uh, all parents want good for their children right all parents want good for their children they want them to go to good universities and the only way to reach good university is getting this high marks right so now if a child wants to do engineering and doesn't get that cut he writes the entrance but still there is a cut to get there if the child doesn't get now the child goes into disappointment okay now when we see that people who don't study do very well in life we only know a very small percentage of those who have not been educated and has done extremely well in life the rest of them all have be, done good in education and also done well in life yes grades are giving a lot of stress to children no doubt about it all the children are getting this 98 97 and 99 percent most of them are getting this because of the various tuitions uh, they go to mathematics tuition physics tuitions chemistry tuition so come back from school tuition 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 so now the question again is where is the talent of the child you're going to school you're studying from there then somebody additionally is helping you out so now the now the whole thing is like everybody is studying towards the exam Okay, and like we said, the physics and chemistry, which I studied in the 10th, didn't help me now because I'm not doing anything dealing with that through that. But if I didn't study those subjects, I wouldn't get admission into a college and I wouldn't be able to do my graduation, post-graduation, move on. I could, if, if I had taken the risk, okay, without studying, I will do all this. I don't know, it would have been a big risk. So yes, children are really, really stressed out because of the grades because they have to get into good colleges. The parents want them to get into good colleges and for them to be successful in life. That's the ladder we see, right? Get good grades in 10th, get good grades in 12th, then go for graduation, go for post-graduation. When you reach good, good colleges, very good companies come there for campus recruitment. So we see the entire path in front of us and we want the children to do well, but there is a lot of stress also going on. So unless the whole education system, which is the uh, the end part changes. I think this grade and the pressure related with the grade, parents chasing the children for grades. Why parents, the children themselves are so uh, obsessed with grades that they are, you know, spending all their time studying. And if they don't get good marks, we hear a lot about children taking away their life and all those kinds of things because children themselves are also obsessed. It's not just parents. Parents are influencing the children. Children are getting obsessed. We have an entire society now that is obsessed with grades. No, that is precisely so my point. True. When, when parents uh, focus on the grades of the children and when they, uh, when they splurge on the children's marks on uh, a public platform, they are indirectly and directly encouraging an unhealthy competition which leads to stress in a household. The neighborly syndrome. You know, all this comes to work. The and the parents yes, are the putting... Yes others into stress, others into pressure. And where are these children going off to? Where are these children going off to? Are they, are they all becoming successful in life? Are they all becoming great engineers and great doctors? I personally know at least half a dozen of them from my own fraternity who call themselves total misfits in their own professions. When somebody wanted to uh, learn English literature and write poetry, he finally ended up doing engineering. When somebody who wanted to be a theater actor became a deputy general manager in a, in a public sector enterprise who says, I get paranoid when my child falls sick because I have not faced life. I am a, I am a cooker driven man. I have been cooked up into a, an engineer. I never wanted to be it. That's a different part of, uh, that's a different part of parenting. This is the mark part. That is where the parents decide the ambition for the children. Precisely. Okay. Now that is a totally different segment. There, I wouldn't agree exactly with what parents say. But also, there's one point that at the age of 17 and 18, when the child has to make a decision for the future, I don't think they're completely 
mature enough to make a decision based on the future like you know uh, when you are deciding something are you is that job going to fetch you success is that job going to fetch you the kind of income that you want is that job going to fetch you development in your career so some element of 50% element of guidance by the parents is required but it has to stop with guidance it should not be pressurized so mark is a totally different thing the other aspect is where we push our child into a career that we choose it should be a 50 50 we guide our children we give them the options these are the very good options that is available now since you have taken science these are the options available to you these are the career prospect uh, prospect for these uh, option this for this option we as parents have to be the guiding force behind the child then the child chooses but i always tell my client when your child chooses a career you should also tell the child that the responsibility of the success and failure of that academics and the career is on the child the child takes a decision then the child should be able to shoulder the responsibility okay i will be successful in this but, but fail, at the same time okay i fail i'm going to be successful but at the same time when the when the parent shows them a particular career are these parents showing them the perils of that career as well or are they only showing the luxurious side of it there are both kind of parents there are i i still have parents who say i want my child to be a doctor i personally thought that that era was over okay but there are still parents who are very persistent on uh, telling that you know my child has to be a doctor if not a doctor engineer but there is so many vast areas in science that the child can choose from okay which has a lot of growth uh you know growth uh, chances for the child so now the question is how far do the parents know what are, are the uh, you know perspectives in these areas what are the success rates in these areas what is the ongoing career uh, you know path in this area how good are we to even uh, advise our children first we need to know what is a job market when our child is entering the 9th or 10th we need to learn the job market what is what is uh, trending in the job market where do we get good jobs for our ch- child where there is a development perspective should also be there there should be you know ch- child should be able to develop in that career so then we can go back and guide the child because the guidance from the parents is very important because we have more experience than the child so it's two things that one we uh, one is about the mark okay we we force them to uh, get the kind of marks they want because they need to get good admission the other one is we force them to follow a career path in these two areas we have to be there as support system for the child and guidance back to the child the rest of it the child has to do with their own capacity their own skill and their own drive to do such things no just in i have a, a small insight into this here we are talking about jobs and career and all that we have designed under the britishers we have designed our educational system to create a set of clerks managers engineers mm-hmm. people who do what they are taught or told where are the entrepreneurs no society no economy has been built by the engineers and the workers and 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 the clerks so site huge economies are built by entrepreneurs people who can think through the system think out of the system what are we developing are we developing a set of clerks and managers in the form of engineers and doctors or should we completely deviate from all this and start creating entrepreneurs who can think out of the box and create things that can simplify life you know engineers yes engineers who can create stuff which can reduce carbon uh, footprints can increase battery lives can identify how to uh, uh, bring in waste management system all this that makes life much more simpler so shouldn't we as responsible parents be directing our children into areas where their natural creative skills could be utilized to create more industries more entrepreneurial opportunities than showing them a a, a job front or a an assembly of different jobs where they are literally uh, honing their skills which is needed by somebody else for x y z reason 
see uh, we need all of this we need entrepreneurs we need engineers we need doctors we need all of this okay so when we are facilitating our children that's what i said parents need to know what the job market is like they have to learn about what are the opportunities then help we can support entrepreneurs but how many of us would be willing to take the risk to support an entrepreneur unless and until we know that our child has a skill in that and for a child of 17 and 8 or 18 it's too early to show any skill at that point of time unless and until he has built up something for himself or maybe he's had a small business at the age of uh, 10 12 no, not ne- know, not necessarily not necessarily mark zuckerberg is, is a classic example when did he start of when did he uh, start a concept called facebook so jill he is a very rare example no, there are so he's many people how do, you know are, how do you know where are how do you know where there and, are other and i don't exist. think and i don't think there are there was any parental pressure or there was any parental involvement behind him there is no he parental involvement behind in him that is a positive hostel. thing yes <laughs> Be- yes because he yes there, there people is, like i don't him. think because in none of the stories parent has come at this thing okay yeah, yeah. none of the biographies of his parental involvement has been there. so we are so, talking about so that is actually a good sign that that's actually a good sign because parents a at sign. time a become a sign. negative But influence indian parenting is Uh, see indian parenting is such that parents are there till the pg of the child most okay 95 to uh, 98% very few parents who are who let their children be what they are as, as, at least in the middle income and uh, higher middle income and lower middle income group people the, the parents are with the children full time supporting encouraging behind them designing their future there are very few people who let their child be what they want to be very few who say okay you choose what you want to be i put you in the best college you can quit college you can start a business and show me something like uh, facebook there are very few parents who are willing to take that risk very few i have seen a very classic example in the nilgiris a father who has done this to the child okay and three children have reached nowhere today reach nowhere three children classic example he said you can do whatever you want you can uh, from ninth i think all of them have good education three of them the children have reached nowhere which is very sad to see because the father has given them the, absolute freedom but then that's again a, that, that's again you a, want a small example you want to start a business that is again a small example like when we're talking about mark zuckerberg we have yeah. this also no, here we, we have so many people parents, They, we we would have had a sachin tendulkar we if, have if, so many. if 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 he didn't have a father who uh, who never pushed him to study more we wouldn't have had a sushant singh rajput if his parent if his parents if his father had pressed on him to complete the engineering he only needed one more semester but look at what true joy that he has given india and the and the kind of financial success also so if you have to focus uh, you know parenting from a financial perspective also these are classic examples that we have and these are all people who come from middle class fam- middle class families see in parenting all that the parents have to realize is we need to we need to know where we draw the line true okay we need to know how much support to give we need to know how much we can let them be freedom but also somewhere unless and until the child shows us the confidence that yes i can handle this i can do this i don't think indian parents will easily let that let go that much even today most of the universities if you go to most of the colleges you go to the first day of admission selecting the admission university everything is done by the parents and when you compare to other other countries i think children finish their high school they work with their own money they go to study while in india i think even till pg we educate them we select their colleges their universities we see that we visit the campus now i see a lot of parents after 12th have been visiting uh, campuses to know how the campus is how where the canteen is where the hostel is and everything so we come from that kind of a background one fine day to revolutionize all this and say okay after 12th you do what you want complete freedom uh, success or failure is up to you it will still take a lot of time for us parents indian parents i would say to reach that area to think okay because we still feel that we have to be behind the children to ensure that yes they have reached 
post graduation then they have got this job or this business if your child wants to start a business the parents invest in the business so we still haven't reached that place where we can give complete freedom to the children after high school and say go make your life i understand i understand i understand now tell us about uh, you know the yeah, about your book you know how you uh, you know the book has been read by a lot of people and i'm sure you're earning you're earning enough money as well <laughs> now no <laughs> <laughs> tales that end tales uh, and i have a great pleasure in also introducing to our viewers that jasina becker's book is currently available the tales that end tales what does it entail tales that end tales is a book about sustainable relationship okay okay uh, when we say relationship it's not just romantic relationships Mm-hmm. we have all the relationship stories in that book that is parenting relationship there is friendship there is romance there is marital relationship grandparenting everything comes in that book it's all about sustainable relationship it's about strong women or weak women who have emerged strong nowhere in the entire book you would find any male bashing Okay. Though it is about strong women, it's equally about strong men. It's about a support system that men and women have for each other. And in and, and during the course of the story, of course, there will be a bad man, there will be a bad woman, because that's how the world <laughs> there is. There has to be. <laughs> But, yeah, there has to be. So this is there. It's not like everybody is good. Okay, maybe the man is bad. But I have made sure that uh, quite often the expectation from a man female writer that there could be some male bashing uh, if the if the woman is emerging strong it definitely has to be male bashing no Correct, yeah. it's not a see so that if you have to show the woman in good element the man has to be in bad element no it's been uh, you know balanced sometimes it goes this way sometimes swings this way but eventually it's balanced out so it's about strong women at the same time it's about strong men it's about relationship sustainability how you grow in a relationship it's about mindful relationship it's all about indian culture it's about indian mindset it's about indian thought process so it's about you it's about me it's about the audience who are listening to this also excellent excellent but i read a news report yesterday which said uh, women are better than men when it comes to multitasking that is complete uh, in in in, uh, in contrast with uh, whatever reports that have come in the past and this has been initiated by the bbc itself and uh, also taking into account a, a, a sizable uh, number of samples and going through and and putting people through that research so do you agree with it or do you think that uh, men are better or women could be better too well i have not done a research on that but then i know with experience uh, that i've had with um, the various men father uh, uh, no brothers of course all, all the men who i have interacted with yes um, women are very good at multitasking it naturally happens to them while men would rather do one job finish it off and go to the next job just like women can think mul- multiple things at the same time and men are very focused in their thoughts ideally uh, they say that you know uh, men uh, have a tunnel vision okay they they look straight and their vision and their thought process is straight while women have a very peripheral uh, vision uh, that is also it's a very good example that uh, women are better homemakers even if you have um, stay at home fathers still women having you know learned a lot from the other women in their life the mothers and the grandmothers in their life they can multitask at home they can multitask at work i'm not saying men cannot but i think a uh, shade better women could be at uh, multitasking i'll give you a classic example i was talking to a male friend of mine while i was reading something on my laptop and having a coffee so as soon as my uh, friend picked up the call he said one second i said what happened he said no no let me shut down the uh, laptop so i was like Uh, i said uh, you were doing something so yeah i was doing something so i have to concentrate on what you're saying i have to shut the laptop at the same time i was my laptop was <clears throat> on i had a coffee in hand three things at the same time while talking to this friend of mine i was still looking at something in the laptop while the man had to switch off 
his laptop to talk to me. So I just thought that was probably a classic example because it was a very casual talk. Nothing to concentrate on the talk. So probably, uh, like I said, I have not done a research myself, but I have read a lot of papers because I do gender studies as well. I have read a lot of papers which says the same thing that women are better at multitasking than men. It never says that men are not multitaskers. It only says women are better. better, which means maybe, yeah, a shade better. That's all. It doesn't say that men are not multitaskers. Correct. Fair so enough. Nowhere fair it enough. says that. It's not, yeah, yeah, fair enough. A shade better. Yeah. And, and yes, I think so. No, if, if the because research proves that women are far both. better. There's nothing wrong in it because mm -hmm. it, 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 if it is yeah. based on some authentic scientific research, uh, then you know, a fact is a fact and fiction remains a fiction. Now, uh, you're a strong woman, Jasina. What makes you a strong woman? Or how do you define a strong woman? And, okay, okay. I have a sub question <laughs> also. Without male bashing. Okay. I don't think the strength that I have uh, derived in life has anything to do with the men in my life. Like that's what you said, male bashing. My strength has been derived from my own experiences and the challenges that I have faced. A strong woman is what, according to me, I would say I'm a strong woman because I have faced a lot of challenges in my life. I have fallen down several times in my life and every time I've fallen down, not literally fall down, you know, hmm. uh, yeah. life challenges has could pull me down and every time I've fallen down I have risen up because I knew that I had to do it for myself I knew that other than me there'll be nobody else who's going to support me full time to grow uh, raise up or grow up in life and I must I would say I'm a strong woman because I've single-handed raised my child I'm a single parent I've single-hand raised my child and the career build-up that I've had uh, because of my need uh, at, at one point after when I needed to build my career it has been single hand. I've never looked upon anybody or anything for support like that. No. Uh, but I'm not saying that, but I'm not saying that taking support is a sign of weakness. Okay. I'm not saying that. I'm only talking from my perspective, how my strength was derived. Probably uh, that was uh, how I became strong. I'm not saying that women who take support from their husband or their fathers or their sons are weak. No, no definitely. that's not what I'm saying. Definitely. Now, uh, coming to the point that you that you talked about being a single parent. Now, uh, yes. being a single parent, does it give you that extra space to dream and do what you want to? No, that would mean male bashing, right? No, no, you no. Just said no, no, no male forget, male men. forget men here. <laughs> forget men here. Okay. They don't exist. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, see, one thing could, uh, one thing I realized in a single parenting is whatever I have to do, uh, take decisions for my child is my own decisions. Okay, so I take responsibility for those decisions. There is not no one to consult, so I take the decision for her. So my single parent in that way is nowhere. There's there's no confusion, and there is no confusion that the father says something, the mother says against it, and the child is confused. My child is not confused because okay. there's only one person saying things. And she accepts or she wants to debate over it. Now, uh, in parenting, I think uh, it works a lot faster when you are uh, you are the single authority in parenting because you don't consult anybody. <laughs> you don't have to say, okay, you do this, I do this because everything I have to do and there's no one to consult. So as a uh, single parent, I think things work a lot faster for me. That's if that uh, satisfies your question. Uh, yeah, I know. If, if it, you don't have to wait for another authority to pronounce the judgment. Yes. Yes. To, to make it simple. Mm -hmm. And that also gives you the advantage of uh, spacing out your time and uh, figuring out how you want to lead your life in terms of your creative. Yeah, there's uh, no, you're not waiting for anybody. You're not expecting anybody else to do something, right? I'm not waiting for someone to do something else, contribute something else to my daughter or expecting that the other parent will do everything I do. The expectations on me, and there's no wait for anybody. Here is a lady yes. who has actually fought with life, somebody who has gone through the grind, ups and downs, and still is, is content with what she is. She's a counseling psychologist, an author, a blogger, somebody who leads a team of 12,000 women when it comes to saris and sisterhood that connects with it. Conversations and Ya yeah, have great gratitude to Jasina Becker for being on our show. Thank, Thank you, you. Jasina. 
for, for being with part Thank of us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And on conversations, uh, it's time uh, to end another episode on YA. Please subscribe to our channel, which is, you have the link below, and be part of our entire range of entertainment, from chat shows to comedy to music, dance, and a lot of contests that are about to come in. And it's time I signed off the big mouth, Sujil Chandra Bose.